What is the nature of the mind? The mind is nothing other than the I thought. The mind and the ego are one and the same. The other mental faculties, such as the intellect and the memory, are only this. Mind, intellect, the storehouse of mental tendencies, and ego, all these are only the one mind itself. This is like different names being given to a man according to his different functions. The individual soul or jiva is nothing but this soul or ego. Arranging thoughts in the order of value. The I thought is the all important thought. Personality idea or thought is also the root or the stem of all other thoughts. Since each idea or thought arises only as someone's thought and is not known to exist independently of the ego. The ego therefore exhibits thought activity. The second and the third persons such as he, you, that, etc. Do not appear except to the first person. Therefore, they arise only after the first person appears. So all the three persons seem to rise and sink together. Trace then the ultimate cause of I or personality. From where does this I arise? Seek for it within. It then vanishes. This is the pursuit of wisdom. When the mind unceasingly investigates its own nature, it transpires that there is no such thing as mind. This is the direct path for all. The mind is merely thoughts. Of all thoughts, the thought I is the root. Therefore, the mind is only the thought I. The birth of the I thought is one's own birth. Its death is the person's death. After the I thought has arisen, the wrong identity with the body arises. Get rid of the I thought. So long as I is alive, there is grief. When I ceases to exist, there is no grief.
when other thoughts arise and disturb you. See whose thoughts they are. They will vanish. They all have their root in the single I thought. Hold it and they will disappear. The ego's phenomenal existence is transcended. When you dive into the source from where the I thought rises, the ego is described as having a threefold form, as having three bodies the gross, the subtle, and the causal. But that is only for the purpose of analytical exposition. If the method of inquiry were to depend on the ego's form, you may take it that any inquiry would become altogether impossible because the forms the ego may assume a legion. Therefore, for the purposes of self-inquiry, you have to proceed on the basis that the ego has but one form, namely that of the I-thought. Self-inquiry by following the clue of the I-thought is just like the dog tracing their master by their scent. The master may be at some distant unknown place, but that does not stand in the way of the dog tracing them. The master's scent is an infallible clue for the animal and nothing else, such as what they are wearing or their build and stature, etc. To that scent, the dog holds on undistractedly while searching for them. And finally, it succeeds in tracing them. Although the concept of I-ness or I am-ness is described as an I-thought, 
It is not really a modification like other thoughts of the mind. Because unlike the other thoughts, which have no essential interrelation, the I thought is equally and essentially related to each and every modification of the mind. Without the I thought, there can be no other modifications or thoughts. But the I thought can subsist by itself without depending on any other modification of the mind. The I thought is therefore fundamentally different from other thoughts. So then, the search for the source of the I thought is not merely the search for the basis of one of the forms of the ego, but for the very source itself, from which arises the I amness. In other words, the quest for and the realization of the source of the ego in the form of the I thought necessarily implies the transcendence of the ego in every one of its possible forms. Conceding that the fundamental I thought essentially comprises all the forms of the ego, why should that modification alone be chosen as the means for self inquiry? Because it is the one irreducible datum of your experience, and because seeking its source is the only practical course you can adopt to realize the self. The ego is said to have a causal body, the state of the I during sleep. But how can you make it the subject of your investigation? When the ego adopts that form, you are immersed in the darkness of sleep. However, the ego in its subtle and causal forms is not too intangible to be tackled through the inquiry into the source of the I thought while the mind is awake. The inquiry into the source of the I thought touches the very existence of the ego. Therefore, the subtlety of the ego's form is not a material consideration.
how can the inquiry pertaining to the ego in the form of the root I thought be of any use, you ask? From the functional point of view, the ego has one and only one characteristic. The ego functions as the knot between the self, which is pure consciousness, and the physical body, which is inert and insentient. The ego is therefore called the knot between consciousness and the inert body. In your investigation into the source of the I thought, you take the essential consciousness aspect of the ego. For this reason, the inquiry must lead to the realization of pure consciousness of the self. You must distinguish between the I, pure in itself, and the I thought, the latter being merely a thought, sees subject and object, sleeps, wakes up, eats and thinks, dies and is reborn. But the pure I is the pure being, eternal existence, free from ignorance and thought illusion. If you stay as the I, your being alone without thought, the I thought will disappear and the delusion will vanish forever. In a cinema show, you can see pictures only in a very dim light or in darkness. But when all the lights are switched on, the pictures disappear. So also, in the floodlight of the Supreme Self, all objects disappear. It is not a transcendental state. What would you transcend and by whom? You alone exist. It is said that the self is beyond the mind and yet the realization is with the mind. The mind cannot think it. It cannot be thought of by the mind and the mind alone can realize it. 
How are these contradictions to be reconciled? The self is realized with dead mind, that is, mind devoid of thoughts and turned inward. Then the mind sees its own source and becomes that, the self. But it is not as the subject perceiving an object. When the room is dark, a lamp is necessary to illumine and eyes to cognize objects. But when the sun has risen, there is no need of a lamp to see objects. To see the sun, no lamp is necessary. It is enough that you turn your eyes towards the self-luminous sun. Similarly with the mind. To see objects, the reflected light of the mind is necessary. But to see the heart, it is enough that the mind is turned towards it. Then the mind loses itself and the heart shines forth. The essence of mind is only awareness or consciousness. When the ego, however, dominates it, it functions as the reasoning, thinking or sensing faculty. The cosmic mind, being not limited by the ego, has nothing separate from itself and is therefore only aware. This is what the Bible means by I am that I am. When the mind perishes in the supreme consciousness of one's own self, Know that all the various powers, beginning with the power of liking and including the power of doing and the power of knowing, will entirely disappear. Being found to be an unreal imagination, appearing in one's own form of consciousness. The impure mind, which functions as thinking and forgetting, alone is samsara, which is the cycle of birth and death. The real I in which the activity of thinking and forgetting has perished, alone is the pure liberation. It is devoid of forgetfulness of self, which is the cause of birth and death.
How is the ego to be destroyed, you ask? Hold the ego first and then ask how it is to be destroyed. Who asks the question? It is the ego. This question is a sure way to cherish the ego and not to kill it. But if you seek the ego, you will find that it does not exist. That is the way to destroy it. There is an absolute self from which a spark proceeds as from a fire. The spark is called the ego. In the case of an ignorant person, it identifies itself with an object simultaneously with its rise. It cannot remain independent of such association with objects. This association is ignorance and its destruction is the object of our efforts. If its subjectifying tendency is killed, it remains pure and also merges into the source. The wrong identification with the body is the I am the body idea. This must go before good results follow. The I, in its purity, is experienced in intervals between the two states or two thoughts. The ego is like that caterpillar which leaves its hold only after catching another. Its true nature can be found when it is out of contact with objects or thoughts. This ghostly ego, which is devoid of form, comes into existence by grasping a form. Grasping a form it endures, feeding upon forms which it grasps it waxes more, leaving one form, it grasps another form, but when sought for, it takes to flight. Only if that first person, the ego, in the form I am the body, exists, will the second and third persons, you, he, they, and so on, exist. How 
However, if by one scrutinizing the truth of the first person, the first person is destroyed, the second and third persons will cease to exist and one's own nature, which will then shine as one, will truly be the state of self. The thought, I am this body of flesh and blood, is the one thread on which are strung the various other thoughts. Therefore, if we turn inwards inquiring, where is this I? All thoughts, including the I thought, will come to an end. And self-knowledge will then spontaneously shine forth. Vichara, self-inquiry, investigation, is a one method for realisation. How is that to be done? One must admit the existence of their self. I am is the realisation. To pursue the clue to realization is vichara. Vichara and realization are the same. You ask, what shall I meditate upon? But meditation requires an object to meditate upon. Whereas there is only the subject without the object in vichara. Meditation differs from vichara in this way. Meditation is concentration on an object. It fulfills the purpose of keeping away diverse thoughts and fixing the mind on a single thought, which must also disappear before realization. But realization is nothing new to be acquired, it is already there but obstructed by a screen of thoughts. All our attempts are directed to lifting this screen and then realization is revealed. If seekers are advised to meditate, many may go away satisfied with this advice but someone among them may turn around and ask, who am I to meditate on an object?
such a one must be told to find the self. That is the finality. That is vichara. Self-inquiry is the process and the goal also. I am is the goal and the final reality. To hold to it with effort is vichara. When spontaneous and natural, it is realisation. If one leaves aside vichara, the most efficacious sadhana, there are no other adequate means whatsoever to make the mind subside. If made to subside by other means, it will remain as if subsided but it will rise again. Self-inquiry is the one infallible means, the only direct one, to realise the unconditioned, absolute being that you really are. Because every kind of sadhana, except that of self-inquiry, presupposes the retention of the mind as the instrument for carrying on the sadhana, and without the mind it cannot be practiced, the ego may take different and subtler forms at the different stages of one's practice but is itself never destroyed. When Janaka exclaimed, Now I have discovered the thief who has been ruining me all along. He shall be dealt with finally. The king was really referring to the ego or the mind. The attempt to destroy the ego or the mind through practices other than self-inquiry is just like the thief pretending to be a policeman to catch the thief. That is, himself. 
self-inquiry alone can reveal the truth that neither the ego nor the mind really exists and enable one to realize the pure undifferentiated being of the self or the absolute. Having realized the self, nothing remains to be known because it is perfect bliss. It is the all. attention to one's own self which is ever shining as I the one undivided and pure reality is the only raft with which the individual who is deluded by thinking I am the body can cross the ocean of unending births Reality is simply the loss of ego. Destroy the ego by seeking its identity. Because the ego is no entity, it will automatically vanish and reality will shine forth by itself. This is the direct method, whereas all other methods are done only by retaining the ego. In those paths, there arise so many doubts and the eternal question, who am I, remains to be tackled finally. But in this method, the final question is the only one, and it is raised from the beginning. No practices are necessary for engaging in this quest. There is no greater mystery than this that being the reality, we seek to gain reality. We think that there is something hiding our reality and that it must be destroyed before the reality is gained. It is ridiculous. A day will dawn when you will yourself laugh at your past efforts. That which will be on the day you laugh is also here and now. <laughs> 